Fall Quarter Unit 3, We Are God's Artwork. Lesson 12, We Are God's Handiwork. Our scripture lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Ephesians 2 and 8 from the King James Version says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subjected to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. <clears throat> Did you know that Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 has been used by the church historically to describe how we cannot earn our salvation through what we do. We simply accept what God has done and continues to do. God made a way through Jesus and chose us to participate in it, and Jesus continues to sanctify us. Our role is to trust that God's way of salvation through Jesus is the only true way the way back to peace and communion with the Father. And you'll find that in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. That Jewish descriptions of the supernatural world frequently refer to Satan as the ruler of the power with the authority over the air. Here, Paul underscores his earlier theme from Ephesians 1 to describe the believers freedom from the grasp of the world and its supernatural powers including the cult of Artemis and Diana. That salvation is the first century in the first century was not a spiritual concept so much as a very real physical idea of rescue from the detrimental situation. Here, for Paul, subject to spiritual oppression by evil powers and destined for judgment and deliverance into peace and prosperity. Here again, the reconciliation with God of which Paul speaks is found in chapter 2, verse 11 through 22. That God's joy 
in this section <clears throat> is unmistakable and is centered entirely on the believer without regard for whether the believer deserves either the transformation or the joy that God takes in simply being generous with his love. That the essence of this section is the before and after a complete transformation of the believer, not only in terms of allegiance, but at an even deeper level, a transformation of identity that changes that person's understanding of reality, focus, response to experiences, and hope. <clears throat> Historical Biblical Background Ephesians was written between 60 and AD 60 and AD 63, and it is one of the greatest writings in the New Testament. Ephesians is one of the prison epistles, along with Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Some scholars believe that Ephesians may have been written while Paul was in prison in Caesarea, prior to his being transferred to Rome. And as, mission, as mentioned before, Paul had some of his greatest successes and challenges during his two-year stay in Ephesus. And the record of his work, along with that of several missionary partners, is described in Acts chapter 19, <clears throat> near the end of his third missionary journey. A chronological record of his travels during his third missionary journey can be found in Acts chapter 18, verse 23 through chapter 21 verse 14 and i would suggest you read it and according to acts chapter 18 verse 22 paul spent a brief period with the church in antioch before departing on his third and final missionary journey in asia minor Acts 18.23 says Paul left Antioch and traveled west through the provinces of Cilicia, Galatia, and Phrygia, eventually arriving in Ephesus, and along the way he spent time strengthening the churches he had founded on his first missionary journey, and you'll find that in Acts chapter 13 verses 6 through 27. And secondary in his second missionary journey, which you'll find in Acts 15, verses 22 through 40. As you will remember, before leaving Ephesus, Paul stated that he would return to Ephesus because he had promised Aquila and Priscilla that he would return to visit them. And you'll find that in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 21. Now, the Bible does not give us an indication of how much time had passed between Paul's initial visit and the final visit, visit to Ephesus, and that's Acts chapter 19, verse 1. But after Paul returned to Ephesus, he found a small group of disciples who had been converted to Christianity, most likely by Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos. And once he settled down, Paul continued to pursue his strategy of reaching out to the Jews. First, in the local synagogues, you'll find that in Acts chapter 19, verse 8. But Paul's efforts were met with resistance from the Jews, causing him to withdraw and begin teaching a small number of disciples in the school of Tyrannus, which was comprised of a mix of Jews and Gentiles. You'll find that in Acts chapter 19, verse 9. Now, during his two-year stay in Ephesus, the gospel expanded throughout the region of Asia, 
and being the bridge leading to the founding of the seven churches of Asia Minor. You'll find that in Acts chapter 19, verse 10. Paul's preaching and teaching was so successful, it became a threat to the practice of sorcery and the worship of Artemis, the patron goddess of Ephesus. And you'll find that in uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 17 through 41. Ephesus was the home of the largest marble temple of Artemis in the world. Artemis was the Greek goddess of hunting and the wilderness. She was worshipped throughout the ancient world and was called Diana by the Romans. The temple in Ephesus was so magnificent that it was one of the seven wonders of the world. People would come from across the Mediterranean world to worship and behold the beauty of the temple. During his stay in Ephesus, Paul nearly destroyed the worship of Artemis and the business of those who made their living peddling Artemis' artifacts. A note, <clears throat> Article 4 in the Baptist Articles of Faith states that we believe that the scriptures teach that the salvation of sinners is holy of grace through the mediatorial offices of the Son of God. Our lesson explains the way and purpose of God's salvation. It is this passage that is the basis of today's lesson. The central truth of these verses is that God has saved us according to his own plan and purpose. And we see this truth in clear and succinct language in the lesson. Ephesus chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 lays out the great theological truth that salvation is by grace and grace alone. Theological truth is the foundational message that is rooted in the very character and nature of God. It is truth that embodies the essence of the eternal God. We believe that salvation is by grace. What is grace, you ask? The Greek word is charis, which denotes favor, loving kindness, goodwill, and service. The familiar definition is God, grace is God's unearned and unmerited favor. It is God's generosity being bestowed freely and without limit upon each of us. We have done and can do nothing to deserve the blessings of God. It is of his own free will and love for us that God chooses to bless and save us. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, Paul wrote, "We Who has saved us and called us a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Therefore, salvation is a complete and sole act of God's grace. In Ephesians 2, grace is mentioned three times in verses 5, 7, and 8. In verses 5 and 8, you will notice that we are saved by grace. And in verses 8 and 9, we see how salvation occurs. It is through faith. Faith is the instrument and channel through which we are saved. And God is the cause. Faith is simply believing without reservation that your life can be different. Faith is trusting Jesus Christ and committing your life to him. It is through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not because of works. So no one can boast 
the purpose for which we are saved is found in verse 10. For we are his workmanship. God recreated us to be his instruments of service. He did this in the Lord Jesus Christ for good works and therefore we have no grounds for which to boast or brag about our individual righteousness before God. It is all filthy rags. And the lesson today reminds us that we are the product of God's creative power. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10 begins Paul's discussion of the spiritual history of the Ephesians and the depth out of which God lifted them from their sins. And that also means us. The defeat or death of the demonic spiritual powers of darkness opened the door for God to create a new people, holy and blameless before him. And this was the fulfillment of his divine will, which was predestined in Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 is an extension of Paul's discussion of the surpassing greatness of the power of God, which was at work when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> Paul reminded them, meaning the Ephesians, and us as well, that they had been adopted into the family of God and had received the forgiveness of their sins. It was not because of anything they had done, we as well, but it was the result of God's mercy and grace. Now chapter 2 is divided into three paragraphs, verses 1 through 3. The Ephesians were dead in their sins and lived according to the prince of the power of this world. Verses 4 through 7, the tone changes with the contrasting conjunction, but Paul continued to point to God's great mercy and power, which were on full display, both when God raised Jesus from the dead and when he made them alive together with him. And verses 8 through 10, bring the passage to a fitting conclusion with the single most important theological truths in the Bible because Paul broke with the traditional Jewish belief that salvation was a matter of keeping the law of Moses, but instead he stated one is saved by God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ and not by works of the law. These verses reveal that God's great purpose was to create a people of his own choosing who would seek to live lives that are pleasing in his sight. Our lesson explained. Paul started his preaching and teaching with a realistic assessment of the Ephesians' spiritual life in verse 1 because he said they were dead in their trespasses and sins. The reference to you is a specific reference to the Gentiles and not the Jews. When he said, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses. And if we take out the words, and you have he quickened, we are left with the words, and you were, who were dead in trespasses and sin. And is the language of the original Greek text. The Apostle Paul was talking to the Ephesians about their lives before they met Jesus Christ. And by saying they were dead, he didn't mean physically dead, but dead to the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. And that also can applies to us who were dead before 
Jesus came into our lives. A note, death in the scriptures is a reference not only to physical death, but to spiritual and moral death as well. And the worst death that one can experience is eternal death, which is total separation from God. When a person chooses to remain in sin throughout his or her life, he or she accepts the penalty of the second death. You find that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, chapter 25, verse 41, Revelation chapter 2, verse 11, chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, chapter 21, verse 8, and Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 through 24. The word trespasses in Greek is paratoma and literally means a slip or a fall. If we picture a man or woman who loses his or her way and strays from the right road in the scriptures, it refers to a deliberate breaking of the laws of God and going in the wrong direction. The word for sin is harmatia and refers to missing the mark for which we aimed. There is no more tragic death than spiritual death. And when one is spiritually dead, he or she is out of fellowship with God. God is the source of all life, and not to know him is to be dead spiritually. In verses 2 and 3, Paul pointed to the signs that mark the man or woman who is spiritually dead. The word walk in Greek is peripatio. It means to walk or the path one takes. In these passages, walk is used figuratively to mean the conduct of one's life or the behavior that characterizes how one lives. The reference to ye, Y-E, indicated that Paul was still referring to the Gentiles in Ephesus. In verses, in verses two and three, <clears throat> Paul also identified five characteristics of those who were spiritually dead. First, they lived according to the standards of the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You'll find that in 1 John chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The word world in Greek is kos, kosmos with a K. Does not refer to the physical environment in which we live because the physical world as God created it is good. The world is, a, is figurative language that expresses what human society is without God as the guiding compass, which assumes that humanity is the measure of all things. Contributing to worldliness is seeking to live without a recognition and respect for God, because to love the world is to get caught up in things that have no permanence. When our entire life is governed by unholy ambitions, selfishness, greed, and the constant lust of things, we are being guided by the world standards. Romans 12 and 2. Second, spiritual death is characterized by a life controlled by Satan. The phrase, the prince of the power of the air, refers to Satan's powers 
that are at work in the universe. Satan is the one who stands over and for everything that God is against. The whole purpose of Satan is to destroy every life that he can. You find that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. It is the presence of Satan, the prince of the air, that is producing the spirit of disobedience in the lives of people. In verse 3, Paul moves from referring to the Gentiles only to referring to the Jews as well. And we is the inclusive language that refers to all people, both Jew and Gentile. We are all driven by the lust of the flesh, and the word conversation refers to the manner of one's life, which is described as being driven by the lust and the desires of the mind. The Greek word for flesh is sark, and refers to the whole man that is orientated away from God toward its own selfish concerns. You find that in Galatians 5, verses 16 through 21, and also in Romans 8, verse 4, chapter 13, verse 14, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 10, 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. And as a result, the unsaved Jews and Gentiles were destined to experience the wrath of God. This represented a hopeless situation without divine intervention. In verse 4, Paul shifts from wrath to grace, from hopelessness to redemption and life. The writer begins with the contrasting conjunction, but. And but is the dividing link between, dividing line rather, between what we once were and what we are now by grace. Paul points out that it was God's great love that was experienced by all. In verse 5b, which is the central theme of the passage, Paul says that those who were once dead have now been made alive in Jesus Christ. You may ask how this happened. It was the act of God's grace. And the word grace in Greek is charis. And is a word that means God's gift. Everything is the result of God's great act of mercy. You'll find that in 2 Corinthians verse 4, chapter 4, verse 1. Salvation begins with God and has its foundation in God. God alone is the author of salvation, and no man or woman can ever be what he or she can be apart from God. In verse 6, Paul returns to the theme of resurrection, but this time noting that those who believe have been raised with him and have been given seats of honor in the heavenly places. You'll find that all in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Everything is the result of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In verse 7, Paul tells the Ephesians and us that in the ages to come, those who have been seated in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ will see the exceeding great riches of his grace. And that not only will believers see God's grace, but will experience his kindness through Jesus Christ as well. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained us, ordained that we should walk in them. The heart of the lesson is found in verses 8 through 10, when Paul states that salvation was purely an act of God's grace, and that grace is one of his favorite words because it means God's undeserved favor. It is the act of God's grace based upon our faith that saved us because no one can save themselves. Romans 10, 8 through 13. Salvation comes to us as a gift from God. And since salvation is a gift, it cannot be earned by doing good works. That's verse 9 of our lesson. We are faced with a contradiction of works versus faith. And the issue is resolved when we understand that there is no contradiction between what Paul taught and what James said regarding works. Works play no part in salvation. However, Christians will show evidence of the change in their lives by the good works they do. James, you'll find that in James chapter 2 verse 14, verses 14 through 26. Remember, we were created as new persons in Christ to do good works. And the word ordained in Greek is proetimazo and refers to God's preparation of us to do good works through regeneration. You'll find that in Romans chapter 9, verse 23. Another note, remember, Every believer is a unique masterpiece shaped and fashioned by God. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ unto good works, which is verse 10 of our lesson. The first part of the verse, the emphasis in the Greek text is on the pronoun his which is a reference to the fact that it is God who made us who we are as believers because we are created in his image, the image of God. That you'll find in Psalm 139, 14. And the word workmanship is a poor translation of the Greek word poema. And it is from this word that the English word poem is derived. It means that which has been made, something created, a masterpiece, a work of art. Another note, when God looked at all that he had made, he knew that there was still something greater to be done. Humanity is the crown jewel of God's creative genius. The zenith of God's power is fully displayed when we come to faith in him. God takes messed up, wretched, worn out, and beaten people and refashions them into new create creatures who are his workmanship. The transformation in the inner nature takes place within the context of our faith in Jesus Christ, who is our model. In other words, our text can put it this way. God has made each of us as a work of art, a creative masterpiece, a one of a kind because of the sacrificial death of Jesus in his resurrection from the dead. The passage helps us understand why each of us is uniquely gifted to do what we do in his service. And according to verse 10b, 
We are created in Jesus Christ, which points to the instrumental means by which God has done this magnificent work in our lives. We should now be able to see the connection of the believer in Jesus Christ, because when we come to God through our faith in the finished work of Jesus at Calvary, we enter the realm of a new relationship. Jesus is now Lord of our lives. In Romans 10 and 9, we find the confessional statement that leads to faith in Jesus Christ, that one who confesses with his or her mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in his or her heart that God raised Jesus from the dead will be saved. Concluding thoughts. People often look for a purpose in life. How do people find meaning and direction for their lives? Ephesians reminds us that God's creative design is embedded in each of us and through Jesus, through Christ, we join in the good work God prepares for us to do. One of the remarkable lessons from this passage is the truth that God is Savior. There is no sin from which God cannot save us. Here is the motivation for Christians to continue the magnificent work of evangelism and discipleship. When we think about it, God has done a great work in each of us, and we must believe that he can do it in others. He can use each of us to reach others who are held bound and draw them into a new relationship with him. God can take anyone's life and do something miraculous in and with it. We must never give up on the lost men and women of our community. We must never give up on those who are down and out in our community. We must never see evangelism as a failed effort at church growth. Since God saved us, he can save anyone. Let all things their creator bless from all creatures of our God and King. Let us pray. O oh God, your mercy is everlasting and your truth endures through the ages. Lord God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant that we may never lose sight of the great gift of salvation. May we receive your gracious gift afresh, and may we, as your handiwork, live lives that fit the richness of your grace. May we see your power which was dramatically demonstrated at the empty tomb when you raised Jesus from the dead. And may that same power be at work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.